Okay, good evening. It's working okay. Uh, welcome to the uh, Edward Said Lecture for this year. I need to uh, say a few words of commitment and, I, and a few more words of thanks. The first words are these. Uh, the Columbia University School of the Arts recognizing, recognizes Manhattan as part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lenny Lenape and Wapinga people. We continue to address issues of exclusion, erasure, and systemic discrimination through ongoing education and a commitment to equitable representation. Uh, I should like to thank various organizations and people, um, the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center for the Humanities, uh, the School of the Arts at Columbia University, and the place where we are, Lenfest Center uh, for the Arts Italian Academy. Uh, I'd like to thank, too, the following individuals, Carol Becker, Dean of Columbia University School of the Arts, Eileen Gilluli, Executive Director of the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center of the Humanities, Gauri Biswanathan, Chair of the Said Memorial Lecture Committee, as I well know, uh, Mariam Said, and all members of the Said Committee. Uh, I should mention, too, that there will be time for questions after Marina's talk. Now a few words about Marina and what we're about to hear. Seeing, seeing is believing. It's a familiar phrase and it means many things. It means different things in different times and places. In her book, Phantasmagoria, in 2006, Marina Warner quotes the poet Andrew McNeely who inverts the proposition in an interesting way. He says, some things must be believed to be seen. Not believed that they are seen, they have to be believed in order to be seen. Uh, believing and seeing, believing and wishing to see, seeing without believing, uh, believing without seeing. Uh, the world of cases like these is the world of Marina's many wonderful books. Why do we believe in strange things? Do we believe in strange things? Are they really strange? Do they become less strange if we understand them better? Marina answers these questions sometimes very well, but mainly she explores them, she revives them, and she changes their lighting. And with these possibilities in mind, she has studied, among many, many other matters, uh, innumerable as <laughs> Roger was just saying to me, many, many other matters. She has studied the history of Joan of Arc, the worship of the Virgin Mary, the invention of photography, the invention of film, uh, 1001 Nights, and of course the wonderful treasures again and again of the fairy tale. Uh, this vast and wonderful interest meets up with several preoccupations of Edward Said, of course, especially with his concern with what we think of strangers who we think are strangers, and what knowledge we imagine we may have of strangers when we have not bundled them up into some convenient myth that suits us better. In her book on A Thousand and One Nights, Marina says she has sought to, quote, give new bearings to the ideas in Orientalism, Edward's book, uh, and to give those new bearings, quote, from the compass of story. Wonderful words, bearings, compass, story. You see wonderfully suggestive words in this context. And they recall what Marina says at the end of her book, Fantastic Metamorphoses, Other Worlds. What she says is, uh, one of the things we want from stories, it seems, is orientation. Not orientalism, but orientation does have a certain flicker of an interesting word in this context. What we want, one of the things we want, Marina says, from stories, it seems, is orientation with regard to the powers that we imagine govern our destinies. Call them gods, or fate, or providence, or chaos, or relativity. She writes of the marvelous geography she has traveled in order to write that book, and she adds, indeed, most of her books, and she adds that, this, which I, is, I, I, is a wonderful takeaway. It would be stupid to suggest stories invariably enlighten. But stories do offer a way of imagining alternatives, 
mapping possibilities, exciting hope, warding off danger, casting spells of order on the unknown ahead. Lectures can work like stories too, and I'm sure this one will. Please join me in welcoming Marina Warner. Thank you very, very much, Michael, and thank you all very much for coming. It's um, very daunting, but also very encouraging to see so many people. And it's a great honor for me to speak um, as an Edward Said Memorial Lecturer. And I very much want to thank the committee, and especially Mariam Said, uh, for the invitation, and Gauri Viswanasan, who first wrote to me uh, with the invitation, and, the, and Columbia itself where Lindsay Schramm has been absolutely magnificent in helping get this going and happen. And also just now, Gavin Browning um, with, in the venue. Since Edward Said's death in 2003, the world has gone through violent convulsions and profoundly changed. Yet several fields of struggle with which Edward engaged so passionately remain sadly as unresolved as ever. Palestine and the whole region there, and where culture is concerned, they are also fraught with fresh tensions. The two strands entanglement with Said's theme in culture and imperialism. And in the book's closing chapter, he turns again to the emblematic figure for him of resistance, the diasporic wanderer, the refugee, the stranger. Already then in their millions, their numbers have since grown. The UNHCR's most recent figures from 2021 number displaced people in the world at 89.3 billion. And that was before the war in Ukraine. People whose current status, Said writes, is the consequence either of decolonization, migrant workers, refugees, gastarbeiter, or of major demographic and political shifts blacks, immigrants, urban squatters, students, popular insurrections, etc. These constitute a real alternative to the authority of the state. What are the possible forms of expression for this real alternative? So in this talk tonight, I'm going to propose that narratives present the prime medium, especially when inscribed onto the places where those who are out of place or powerless find themselves. However, offering story and storytelling as a prime resource for resistance to forms of oppression leads to the great difficulty, which actually Michael put his finger on in his kind introductory words, which, were pointed, which was pointed out trenchantly by Roland Barthes earlier on in his essays, Mythologies, and recognized very wearily by Said that stories, literature, fiction, poetry have been and are used to entrench dominant ideologies. With the current drift towards strident ethnic nationalism in Italy, Sweden, Hungary, and France, as well as Britain and the United States, it could not be more crucial to contest claims to ownership of tradition, not only historical, but also imaginary. As Edward warned us over 20 years ago, between the extremes of discontented, challenging urban mobs and the floods of semi-forgotten, uncared for people, the world's secular and religious authorities have sought new or renewed modes of governance. And quick continue, quote, none has seemed so easily available, so conveniently attractive as appeals to tradition, national or religious identity, patriotism. And because these appeals are amplified and disseminated by a perfected media system addressing mass cultures, they have been strikingly, not to say frighteningly effective. That's also towards the end of culture and imperialism. His words still ring very powerfully 20 years on. He went on, merely to urge students to insist on one's own identity, history, tradition, uniqueness, may initially get them to name their basic requirements for a democracy and for the right to an assured, decently humane existence. But the fact is we are mixed up with one another in ways that most nat national systems of education have not dreamed of to match knowledge in the arts and sciences with these integrative realities 
is, I believe, the intellectual and cultural challenge of the moment. In his memory, I'm going to attempt to challenge this challenge, as urgent as ever. First, by looking at Edward's personal and unexpected feeling of fitting ill into society and his ambivalences about being a stranger. For someone who felt so keenly that he did not belong, Edward in person struck those around him as elegant and masterly, even patrician, extremely stylish in everything he touched. I've heard him play Beethoven, lecture in French, discourse with ferocity and incisiveness on a huge range of topics, literary, musical, political, with his vehement desire to puncture false consciousness. He seemed at home in many worlds through the commonwealth of culture, which he celebrated alongside Daniel Barenboim and the, with the creation of the West East Divan Orchestra. As a family friend, Nadia Gindi commented, in fact, Edward found a homeland in the act of writing, and one might add, of reading too. And yet he felt himself somehow out of place and consequently strongly identified with the marginal, the fugitive, the figure of the diasporic stranger. In the essay, Secular Criticism in the World, the Text and the Critic, Edward argues that the role of the critic is to engage with social and political issues. Social and political issues. Criticism, he writes, must think of itself as life-enhancing and constitutively opposed to every form of tyranny, domination and abuse. Its social goals are non-coercive knowledge produced in the interests of human freedom. Said's voice is fiery, his mode adversarial, and I'd like to keep faith with the incisiveness and irony, but modify his outlook in the light of popular culture expressions, not literature as such. I've always felt that artifacts created by the power of the imagination can reach deeply and broadly, more deeply and broadly than the finest scholarly criticism, and that the main arena of struggle is fantasy, fantasy taking, taken, broadly speaking, to embrace magical narratives, from hagiography to fairy tales forms of storytelling that flourish in popular milieu among less valued elements of society who are often subject to condescension and mockery from their own clergy and prelates, but enjoy the supreme distinction of being intrinsically informal and unofficial, t tending to heterodoxy and extending opportunities beyond the control of hegemonic arbiters. I feel great sympathy with Anna Della Subin and her recent study, Accidental Gods, for her approach to other people's beliefs, even when they seem ridiculous, like worshiping Prince Philip as a god. <laughs> Throughout her book, she probes what, what needs the worship meets among the people who perform it. Even more significantly, she also trusts, ultimately, the beneficent potential of active imagination and its project, products. She uh, quotes, sorry, she declares, myth is enlightenment, and it summons us to the work of transformation. It seeks to find the origin, the cause, the reasons why things are the way they are, and thus to shape the future. Different ideas of divinity determine what form political rule should take. I should perhaps clarify briefly my own relations to belief. I was brought up a Catholic and was passion a passionate believer until the age of 17. And I've since used historical and deconstructionist inquiry to understand the mythopolitics which still pervades contemporary experience. You need only think of the recent mass response to the death of the queen in England. The mysteries of the Christian faith seem to me as non-rational as other so-called primitive faiths. But this position no longer leads me to want to demolish them with reason or attempt to strip away illusion through analysis and argument. I have come to think that human thought processes are necessarily and inextricably bound up with imagination. And this will lead to fantastic products. Even Newton, for all his supreme analytical intelligence, pursued with unappeasable passion studies in astrology and alchemy. Furthermore, as you all know, rationality has led to the worst moral and epistemological catastrophes. Therefore, I now want to raise alternative stories, reinscribe old ones to divert their course. The poet Denise Riley, in her recent collection, Lurex, looks back in one of the poems at the saints and martyrs of her childhood, and she puts a question that is also a wish. What hope is there of a purely secular grace? She sounds skeptical, 
but also yearning. I share these mixed feelings, but if we are ever to find a purely secular grace, borrowing from long-serving ways of hallowing, as developed by liturgical and ritual practices, might help discover ways of being at home in the world. The story of the flight into Egypt, which appears in many early versions, Greek, Latin, Syriac, Arabic, and Ethiopic, will offer us tonight a prime example from the literature of astonishment, the genre Arabic scholars term a jaib, of a narrative used to shape integrative realities in both attitudes and values. Taking my cue from Albert Alfred Korzybski and his axiom, the map is not the territory, I'm tracing the story's imprint on geography throughout the Nile Valley in Egypt, displaying how a fantasy narrative can be realized, graven in rock and stone, announcing it happened here to people like you and me. This principle of materializing the imaginary in a landscape underlies cultural memory and offers a process of bringing home to a place of exile. Storytelling can play a double role in this respect. A story may serve to make somewhere familiar by projecting onto it familiar features of home and thereby counter alienation, that state of estrangement that comes over those who have been unhomed. It may also simultaneously enchant the strange land by casting it as historically safe, just, hospitable. It can open a door to a secondary world, to use the term W.H. Auden shows and, not, and Tolkien popularized, and reveal an, a new sympathy in the environs. The flight into Egypt is a familiar episode from the New Testament, which is echoed in the Quran. I must admit that Edward's ghost may be shuddering at this choice. He is equivocal about his family of Christian adherents. On the one hand, he pays handsome homage in Out of Place to his paternal aunt Nabiha's work at the heart of the Protestant community in Cairo to help refugees from Palestine. But he's scornful of another relative, calling her an early avatar of today's Jesus freaks, who would regale her captive audience in the doctor's waiting room with slideshows about the Holy Family, something I seem to be doing tonight. These may well have included scenes from the flight into Egypt. Edward was abrasive, but he didn't close his mind, and he was always hospitable, to my, very, very hospitable, kindly, to, to my interest in fantastic myths, fairy tales, the Thousand One Nights. I've picked out the flight as it relates directly to exile, and exile in Egypt at that. And the story's various interpreters never waver in their solidarity with the fugitive family, who prefigure in their danger, need, hunger, and thirst, their sheer exposure, the state of all forced exiles. The ordeals the family suffers as the three of them wander homeless in Egypt and the welcome they are, they are also, that also greets them here and there along the long way are depicted as bringing blessings on the place. Freshwater springs, fertile fruit groves miraculously appear. With a fairy tale desire for vindication, they also see their enemies struck down by divine punishments. Tyranny is overthrown, false gods fall from their pedestals, and the different strands of the story proclaim the ruin of the old order that brought harm to people like them. Ruins offer hope of transformation, as Susan Stewart writes in The Ruin Lesson. And in the Apocrypha, ruination envelops Mary, Joseph, and the baby, themselves ragged and houseless wretches, figures of ruin, but the story promises ruin averted. <clears throat> of all the scores of artists who have rendered the scene, Rembrandt captures for me the depth of sympathy he can stir and speaks to the current predicament of so many displaced people. In a small painting of 1620, sorry, I missed it. Oh, I've got it wrong. I'll go back. In a small painting of 1620, a halo glows around the head of the baby, but otherwise, Rembrandt strips away supernatural, miraculous elements to focus on the everyday ordinariness of the couple and their child. The slashing downward strokes and frantic hatchings, especially on the right there, of the burin on the plate sharpen the urgency of their predicament. Mary looks out at us, her face lopsided, her eyes apprehensive, hunted. A hard rain falls. They add an apocalyptic accent to the scene. The artist returned to the story again and again, and his pen and ink drawings and prints exude intense fellow feeling for his subjects. His portrayal of the family is a homely group on the road, such as he might have seen among his neighbors, the recent mother worn down by her experience, 
draws on his many sketches of vagrants and beggars he made of the urban poor of Amsterdam. Darkness gathers around the fugitives as they make their way, the donkey weary too. He retains some specificities of the traditional story. Joseph is older than his wife as he trudges along leading the donkey. The artist imagines them striking camp for the night round a fire, their figures very small and vulnerable in the empty darkness around them. Rembrandt's gift for emotional drama, his tenderness and compassion rooted in personal observation exemplifies the commonality of the sacred story. The message about the exhausted and downtrodden conveys the command to declare and shelter issued in both Islam and Christianity, especially towards the poor. The seven works of mercy in the latter, the duty of almsgiving and mutual support, according to the former. His reenactment of the scene on the humble, person, popular stage expresses the apogee of a humanist ethical understanding of this story. Rembrandt read scripture carefully, and he keeps, a close, he keeps close to the canonical story as it appears in the Gospel of Matthew, told of a sequence of eight verses in chapter two. Joseph is warned by an angel that Herod, the ruler of Galilee for the Roman authorities, is seeking the child to kill him, and that he, Joseph, should take Mary and the baby and flee to safety in Egypt. Joseph immediately obeys. Herod, meanwhile, orders the massacre of all the babies under two years old in Bethlehem. Three years later, Joseph is again visited by an angel in a dream and told that Herod has died. The family can safely return to Nazareth. The evangelist is intent on showing that Jesus of Nazareth will fulfill the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, for example, from Isaiah, is a plain speaking oracle. But in the case of the family's flight from Herod, the links between the Old and New Covenants can sound strained. Uh, Matthew invokes a prophecy. When Israel was young, when Israel was young, I loved him and I called my son out of Egypt. Matthew reprises this boldly, writing, Mary, Joseph, and the child stayed until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Typology, oracles, figural patterning. Said, in his introduction to Mimesis, alludes to these ways of story making that can yield poetic and ethical truths and be applied to reading signs beyond words and letters. Mythic material demands this way of reading, which when applied allows an ethics of hope to flower and opens a text to poetical truth-telling distinct from historical veracity. This structure, oracular in meaning, architectural in form, endows imagery with doubled voices. Speaking in chords resonating across time, the past becomes prologue. The story of the flight came to be received as a historical account mapped onto the geography of Egypt and scripture was invoked to support the sanctuaries created along a long, wandering route from the Nile Delta to the Upper Egypt, which the family were meant to follow during their three years' exile. A whole chain of vast monasteries punctuates this route. As you know, the flight into Egypt caught the imagination of many, many early writers. In the history of Christianity, several apocryphal gospels elaborate richly on the exile, while at the beginning of Islam, Egypt also figures as a place of refuge for Maryam, Mary, when she gives birth to Issa, Jesus, in the Muslim tradition. Egypt also became, for Edward Said, a place where he was out of place, a first exile before America. It was the refuge the Said family took after 1948, when Said was 13 years old. In the book of Exodus, when his first child is born in Midian, in the Sinai, Moses says, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Moses' own estrangement has many branches. His childhood was spent at Pharaoh's court after he was saved from the bulrushes by Pharaoh's daughter. He later fled to Midian after he killed an Egyptian, and there he is taken for an Egyptian and begins working for a Midianite priest. The Midianites, an Arabian tribe, worshipped a god they called Yahweh, as Said discusses in his account of Freud's views on the development of monotheism. He marries, Moses marries the priest's daughter, Zipporah, who in some interpretations is an Ethiopian. Zipporah and Moses have two children, sorry, have two children, um, Gershon and Eliza, 
And Ger in Gershon means a sojourner, a passing stranger, a stranger in a strange land. After Moses has seen God in the burning bush and several miracles have proved to him that he can trust the divine summons he's received, he sets out with his wife and children from Midian back to Egypt. This is the passage that prefigures the later journey the holy family of Mary, Joseph, and the infant Jesus will make. And Moses took his wife and children and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Edward Said in Out of Place is reflecting on his own sense of himself as a Palestinian brought up mainly in Egypt, as an American, and in a profound level through his work on European comparative literature, a humanist in the mold of the Renaissance ideal. In Freud and Moses, the non-European, Edward reflected on Freud's provocative theories about Moses. His self-reckonings connect his feeling of estrangement with a pride in his strangeness, and a growing sense that his singularity is precisely not singular, but plural, and an, a resource that enlarges him. In a very famous passage, he writes, I began to think and write contrapuntally, using the disparate halves of my experience as an Arab and as an American to work with and also against each other. Since antiquity, Egypt has been perceived as a laboratory of knowledge, especially esoteric knowledge, alternative, magical, a locus of supernatural power, and in the biblical tradition, a place of servitude from which Moses delivered the Israelites, as well as a sanctuary where the savior, the child Jesus, fled there from the murderous designs of Herod. The figural significance of Egypt is also marked in Muslim tradition. The complex strands are interwoven, especially in the main sources, apocryphal gospels, written in Arabic and Syriac, and pious legends that were composed and circulating during the first centuries of our era before and during the emergence of Islam. This wonderful corpus of stories, several unearthed in the great deposits of Oxyrhynchus on the banks of the Nile north of Luxor in Upper Egypt, form a fabulous corpus in the genre of Ajaib, which would include wonder tales, except that they ask for belief and reverence from their listeners and readers. Edward might not have liked sacred, sacred folklore recognized as a form of literature, but his ideas about culture and imperialism illuminate the tale's function 2,000 years ago when they supported claims to identity and belonging, and today when they exemplify the way the traveling tale underpins social and political relations. Without any disrespect towards the faith of Christians and Muslims, the vision of the past and the, or of the order of destiny that this kind of marvelous story forms show us the central role that the imaginary plays in the formation of meaning for the communities that receive and circulate its creations. As for Egypt in the childhood of Jesus, it represents a site of magical knowledge, as I said, where prodigies and miracles have always been considered autochthonous. What interests me even more is the hope of coexistence that flickers at their heart. Without question, writes Stephen J. Davis, a religious studies scholar at Yale, this is quote, Muslim and Arabic Christian readers still read these infancy tales for their own distinctive theological and social purposes and occasionally used such stories to mark off religious difference. Nonetheless, their respective interpretations of Jesus' childhood were shaped by, and in turn helped shape, a shared sensibility, a common cultural heritage. He goes on to identify four specific areas of coexistence and practice. Scriptural interpretation, storytelling about prophets, uh, sorry, storytelling about prophetic miracles, the production of scientific knowledge and ascetic discipline. Quote, through these particular practices, he writes, the Christ child became part of a shared cultural memory among Christians and Muslims in the Islamic Near East. To these categories of inquiry, I would add the mapping of place and the attempt to fashion a sanctuary, in other words, a place of safety, a grounding, a home. The figure of the Virgin Mary and the multiple narratives in which she appears forge a common lieu de mémoire, or commonplace. She occupies a place of great importance in the Muslim imaginary and faith. A whole surah, surah 19, called Maryam, is dedicated to her, and granting her more space, and she's granted more space in the Holy Book of Islam than in the New Testament. Other passages in the Quran also honor her. She's the only woman named in the Quran, and she is considered a great saint, even a prophet. 
a strong theological movement in ecumenical circles searches for a rapprochement between Islam and the Catholic and high Protestant churches through the person and symbol of Mary. Many pilgrimages all over the world are dedicated to her, as you know, but what interests me is that there are sites in Egypt where Copts and Muslims, the majority of believers in the country, meet to do honor to her. For example, at Zaytun in Cairo, where she made a series of apparitions in the 1960s. The Quranic story of the birth of Jesus is that Maryam receives the message of an angel. The Arabic word is sometimes rendered as a perfect man, who tells her that she will have a child. As in the Gospel of St. Luke, Mary protests, it cannot be, since no man has ever touched me. But the narrative continues, so she conceived him and withdrew with him to a distant place. There, labor pains came upon her as she stood by the trunk of a palm tree. She cries out in pain that she wishes she could die and disappear from the memories of men before all this was forced upon her. A voice from above intervenes and tells her, do not grieve. The unnamed voice continues that the, and to tell her that the Lord has caused a stream to flow, down, flow at her feet and that if she shakes the trunk of the palm tree, it will drop down on you dates soft and ripe. The voice then commands her, rejoice, but not to speak a word today to any human being. The mysterious injunction of silence foreshadows the mutism of many heroines put on trial by fate, from Cordelia to the sister of the brothers who had been turned into seven ravens in the fairy tale. It's a strong magical motif to make manifest heroic female virtue. Mary, after giving birth, returns to her relatives with, her, with the child and they reproach her bitterly, accusing her of being impure, of committing a monstrous act. She keeps silent, as the voice had ordered, and points to the baby to indicate that he will explain. Her relatives doubt that an infant could do so, but the child announces aloud at some length his vocation as a prophet and his total submission to his mother. Egypt is not given as the, place of the, the deserted place where Mary retreats but a tenacious tradition designates it as such. And in the later Surah 23, the believers, Maryam again appears. We made the son of Mary as well as his mother a wonder, and we gave them both shelter on a firm hill with a spring. This verse seems to point to a correspondence with the flight into Egypt and has given rise to the pilgrimage sites where, according to tradition, the Holy Family stopped and found shelter during the three years they spent in Egypt. And among these shrines, scattered all over the, of the Nile Valley, some are identified with specific Quranic tradition. For example, al makrizi a 15th century historian, recognized a palm tree in the southern Nile Valley as the very tree where Maryam gave birth. Significantly, the more unofficial the devotion, the less upper clergy are involved in authorizing it, the less intra-faith hostility arises, it seems to me. The closer to folklore the supporting tales of miracles and visions lie, the less division between the petitioners. The shrines offer hope to women across faiths. <coughs> they pray for the love of a good man, for a child, for safety giving birth, or for respite from further childbearing, and for cures, especially of sick or disabled children, since the infancy apocrypha tell of Jesus is serves miracle working powers, especially in this regard. Several apocryphal gospels which circulated far and wide from their origins in the early years of Christianity and Islam embroidered fantastically on the Egyptian period of Jesus' life. The Proto-Evangelium of James and the Pseudo-Matthew and the Gospel of Thomas and another, the Gospel of Mary. More importantly, the Arabic infancy gospel, which was probably written in the 6th century and also exists in a partial Syriac version, reports yet more signs and wonders around the conception, birth, and youth of the child Jesus. The many miracles that happened to help the Holy Family on their way inspire scenes in medieval and Renaissance art, revealing how traveling tales appeal across centuries and leap boundaries of language and even creed. Some of the artists who spread these wonders far and wide seem to have heard of episodes that the authors of the Arabic Gospel of the Infancy were also picking up. It isn't possible, with such heavy traffic of magical tales, to ascertain sources or precedents. Rather, the surfacing of a scene here and there should draw attention to the way ideas circulate beyond dogmatic divisions and ethnic definitions. 
The dates are disputed, and I'm not in any sense someone who can pronounce on such questions. The apocryphal gospels are composed and written both before and after the Quran, as I said, and the echoes between the texts are numerous and resonate, but with marked differences. Nevertheless, the parallels are rich and poetic, and we must remember that the documents that have survived the centuries are not complete. Several important apocrypha were found in the excavations of Oxyrhynchus not so long ago. Nevertheless, it is obvious that from the third century to the seventh and eighth, the profusion of wonders and stories poured forth in the whole region from Syria to Egypt, and that the Quran and the miraculous events told after the revelation to the prophet grew in this same territory, that an exchange of ideas, motifs, and images enriched the legacy of the two religions. The gospel called the Pseudo-Matthew, for example, was composed during the eighth century, and therefore after the vision of the prophet, so the currents of influence run in both directions. The signs and wonders in both traditions were inspired and respond to one another. The pseudo-Matthew, so-called by the parallels with the canonical gospel, follows the conventional story, but adds fabulous episodes with a strong echo of the Quranic scene. Of these, the most familiar is the rest on the third day of their flight. I just want to see what the next one is. Oh, there's the, there's the, these are the maps of the, sorry, these are the maps of the pilgrimage routes. I'll come back to those later. Yes, so the most, uh, on the third day of the flight when the Holy Family pauses on the road and Mary, thirsty, tired and hungry, asks Joseph if they can stop under the shade of a palm tree. He leads her and the child on the donkey and she sits down. Seeing the fruit on the tree above, she sighs to be able to pick it and Joseph replies that the tree is much too high and that they need fresh water more. Immediately, the child Jesus begs the tree to bend down, no sooner said than done. After they've eaten, the child commands the tree to stand up again, but to open its roots and reveal the stream of fresh water flowing under its trunk. In, in variations of this episode, angels bend the tree, date tree so that she can pick the fruit and at the same time reveal a spring at the basis of the tree, as depicted in Martin Schongauer's engraving, a medium crucial to the spread of these stories far beyond their desert origins. The scene inspires a varied and rich tradition of magic and according to taste, seductive fantasies. For example, it is said that the stone of each date is marked with a small O to honor the Virgin Mary, who exclaimed after tasting the miraculous fruit, oh, <laughs> I, have to, I had to ascertain this, of course. It's absolutely true. Every date has got a tiny little O written on it. A small, a small etiological myth among the multitude of stories of the origins of things. But in this case, the origin of a detail I'd never ever noticed and never would have. In the pseudo-Matthew's account of the flight into Egypt, pagan idols fall from their pedestals. You can see one in the background, I think. Yes, on the left. The, yes, on the left there, you can see it. As the Holy Family approaches, a large, they're out of order because I sent them in a bit earlier than, so I, than I'm finishing the essay, finishing the lecture. A large cornfield miraculously appears, grows up overnight, so that when Herod's soldiers, in hot pursuit of the family, ask the locals if they have seen them, they are able to answer truthfully that nobody has passed that way since the corn was sown. This echoes a story about the prophet, that when he was hiding in a cave from his persecutors, a spider wove a web over the entrance so that witnesses could truthfully say that nobody had recently entered the cave. In all the infancy apocrypha, the child has powers. Dragons, lions, and wild beasts bow down and adore him. He heals the sick and raises the dead. He slides down rainbows. When Je Joseph makes some mistakes in his carpentry work, Jesus corrects the planks he has cut and makes them fit. When his school friends don't show the child proper respect, he kills them and then raises them from the dead. <laughs> he, he also brings inanimate matter to life. He models birds from clay, claps his hands, and they f I've got everything in order, disorder, I'm sorry. He, they cla they, he claps his hands and they fly from, from them, a miracle which he performs in the Quran. Um, though in the Quran, like God creating Adam, he breathes into the clay figures to bring them to life. These narratives of miracles and, probabilis and prodigies hardly resemble fiction as understood in relation to the constitution of the subject or the representation of society. Like fairy tales, they are characterized by syncopated handling of time, non sequiturs, cryptic epiphanies, cryptic epiphanies, 
and startling prodigies, from exceptional natural portents to supernatural healings and resurrections. They are, above all, inauthentic by the standards of canonicity and historical accuracy. Yet in their syncretism, they do not demarcate strong borders. And for this quality, I think they offer an antidote to the edicts handed down by authorities, secular as well as religious, to define true culture, to true literature. Such miracles seemed far too close to pagan magic for comfort among Christian theologians, and the documents were condemned as heretical. But this did not prevent their popularity in manuscript illumination and prints, as we have seen, and in other visual materials. Tiles, tiles made in 1310 to 30 for a local church in Tring in the Chiltern Hills in England shows many of these exploits, including an episode when Jesus frees a playmate from the tower in which he's been locked up by his father to prevent him associating with the weird child Jesus. And G Jesus pulls his playmate out through the keyhole. See him on the right there. The tiles are unique survivals. Their makers unknown, but they exemplify how tales travel, and in this case, last in baked clay. The Arabic gospel is the most packed with wonders, several found only in this narrative. At the approach of Jesus, a possessed child, the son of a priest, is cured. This is the first of a series of wonders. Soon after, a possessed woman is healed, then another, followed by the cure of a little girl who is suffering from leprosy after she's bathed in water in which the baby Jesus has been washed. A garment worn by the child or the water in which Mary bathes him or washes his clothes are frequent instruments of such cures. Scenes unique to this apocryphal work in Arabic were known in Italy as a series of base relief bronzes reveals. The Holy Family are then waylaid by robbers, Titus and Dumacus, um, who take them prisoner. And the infant prophesies that in 30 years' time they will be hanged beside him and that Titus will be saved because he recognizes the baby as the savior and had bribed Dumacus for not, not to molest them. The presence of the two thieves highlights this fundamental principle that we saw governing Matthew's gospel. The authors work with prophetic figuration, not historical records. The Syriac version of the Arabic infancy gospel is packed with further startling anecdotes. A young woman employed by the Holy Family to help them meets three sisters coming from a cemetery accompanied by a male, a mule, a covered in splendid silks, which they caress while weeping loudly. They, con they confide in Mary's servant, someone not previously mentioned, that they were visiting the tomb of their parents who had left them an immense fortune and that the animal they are tearfully caressing is none other than their brother, transformed into a mule by an enchantress whom he's unfortunately married. <laughs> Here we find ourselves in pure terrain of ajaib, a wonder, and in which, in, which encompasses fairy tale and myth. And a very similar story occurs in the Arabian Nights. But the narrative is also spiritual, so the fable turns into a miracle, a sign of divine power. The maid takes the sisters and their metamorphosed brother to Mary, who implores, implores Jesus to help them. And the mule is changed back into a young man again, and with a return to the world of the Thousand and One Nights, he takes the young maid for his wife. The repertory of miracles in the Syriac variant is long and a little tedious, it must be confessed, but it demonstrates the effectiveness of Mary's mediations with her son, the belief in second-order relics, such as swaddling bands, and the fundamental link between miracle and purifications. Um, de de demons are driven out of madmen, lepers are healed, uh, their skin washed clean of the disease. The shrines on the route are primarily places, of he places where healing is sought. A contemporary writer who has consciously adopted this fictive mode to the bafflement of the critics is J.M. Kutsia. From 2013 to 2019, Kutsia published a trilogy of novels which invoke the New Testament in their titles, The Childhood of Jesus, The School Days of Jesus, and The Death of Jesus. The, stories, the story centers on, on an uncanny, prodigious orphan boy in a strange place at an unspecified time, with a feel of the present or perhaps the near future. The child is never called Jesus as such, but is known as David. He's adopted by an older man, Simon, who feels compelled to take charge of him, and a woman, Inez, who's inexplicably recognized by Simon as destined to be David's mother. This election, somewhat resembling the numinous calling of Matthew in the New Testament, 
replaces the Annunciation to Mary and represents Katsia's off-kilter, inscrutable approach. The boy and his mismatched and perplexed parents are also migrants, fleeing one place for another called Novilla, New Town. They will be displaced again. They remember only fragments of their lives before and who they were. When David is noticed and labeled a strange child by the authorities, the makeshift family must move again. While resisting interpretation, the three novels palpably align themselves with uncanonical literature and the and apocrypha. For the young protagonist of Katsia's fable is likewise unique, prodigious, and unintelligible. He is a charismatic figure, a kind of magus with a peculiar aura who ineluctably draws those around him to care for him, follow him. In the last book, he falls mysteriously ill and dies. It's hard to catch Katsia's tone. He's clearly not a subaltern, but has himself chosen to leave his native South Africa for Adelaide in Australia, and public his public identity is now hybrid, South African-Australian. But the novels are heterodox as works of contemporary fiction, as well as reinventions of the figure of the young Jesus. Are they seriously intended or parodies? Deep reflections on displacement, charisma, and providence, or mocking fables? Are they oblique attacks on trust in charismatic figures? The inscrutability is the point, I think. The writer is unquestionably engaged with an alternative tradition distinct from both the analytical novel of Maurice and the magical realist fiction of dream and fantasy. Kotsia destabilizes psychological and social norms of mimesis, creates a strange hero, and follows him into a made-up countries of exile, contemporary dystopias, as he exercises a powerful, mysterious effect on his surroundings. I think I can hazard that if Katsia were not a Nobel Prize-winning writer, no publisher would have touched these books, uh, which resist comprehension and conventional storytelling so truculently. However, I admire them. I enjoy the sense of disorientation they induce, and Katsia's double iconoclastic moves against pieties, literary and religious. But it would be clumsy to read Katsia as a contemporary Voltaire, for the South African author's social critique shows no sign of Voltairean levity. The Jesus trilogy is funny peculiar, written in Katsia's characteristic formal monotone, as if he was struggling with a foreign language, and the phrasing is stiff and lusterless, which intensifies the bizarre effect of the scenes evoked. However, this simplicity and lack of ornament picks up on the genre of the apocrypha, whose authors also tend to declare their miracles, their marvels, bluntly, blocking out the narrative in paratactic sentences following one upon the other. At a midpoint in the first book, The Childhood of Jesus, Katsia stages a discussion between Simon and others about the concept of the real. One of the interlocutors argues that climate is real because you can feel the wind and the rain, but history cannot be felt in the same way. He looks around. Which of us has had his cap blown off by history? There is silence. No one, because history has no manifestations, because history is not real, because history is just a made up story. Here, Katsia is addressing the question of writing the past and letting the reader into his confidence, admitting to the unreliable, unreliability of his literary art. He is not a historian, but has written fictions that are intricately bound up with history. In the Jesus trilogy, he almost declares his work apocryphal and the writer's work, akin to marvelous tales, spun to disturb received ideas, throw open doors to possibilities. I've missed showing you the Jesus making clay birds come to life. Um, the exchange between Katsia's characters admits that stories are effective also when they're fabricated, as they most frequently are, which is where the work of literature plays such a part in ways of dwelling. In 1931, the philosopher Alfred Korzybski coined the crisp and pungent phrase, the map is not the territory. He was talking in relation to neurolinguistics and pointing out how our perceptions and beliefs as individuals and members of a society gathered over time form reality. They constitute the territory as it is experienced, whatever its actual coordinates. Maps are also a way of forging history, as I don't have to tell you, as we see the practice and consequences only too well in the world today. Elizabeth Bishop was not perhaps right when she wrote, more delicate than the historians are the map maker's colors but her poem does catch the potential of cartography for a different form of narrative memory, one that responds to the past, but
but acts proleptically to dream up an alternative reality to come. It also epitomizes an all-important stratagem of appropriating sacred languages for secular social purposes. Here, for example, is a tomb with no religious affiliation. Here is a, there is a ritual act of blessing, propitiation, and consolation that depends on no higher cosmology. Ways of dwelling in times of loss need to access, to annex, these long-tried languages of symbolic action. The marvelous does not remain on the mouths of storytellers or on the pages of writings, but is inscribed on the territory, conferring precise coordinates on the prodigious events and thus embodying material landmarks, buildings where such and such took place, trees which witnessed the miracles, stones which retained the imprint of the events. It's less a literature than a form of land art, often audible rather than visible, less intelligible than cryptic, inscribed in signs. This slippage between the imaginary and the actual can be seen everywhere in the pilgrimages that identify the place and make it historical and, so to speak, real, erasing, in effect, the primary role of the imagination in establishing the identity of the sacred territory in the first place. Maurice Halbwasch Halb is the great scholar of these themes. His magnificent and courageous work, The Legendary Topography of the Gospels in the Holy Land, A Study in Collective Memory, was published in Paris in 1941. It was followed 11 years later by another remarkable work, Les Cadres Sociaux de la Mémoire, the frameworks, the social frameworks of memory. Albuwash demonstrates, in relation to the Holy Land, that the roots of the holy places of Jerusalem developed long after the events they commemorate, and the stories they tie to the map of the city and its surroundings. This is the fruitful distinction between map and territory. A map presents us with geog ge geographical, geological, and even civic facts, but territory encompasses meanings that come to us from beliefs and stories, which are often considered to be fused with history, but are projected. They are signs planted in situ. The place becomes a text, a traveling text in Saidian terms, and it then re reproduces itself in artifacts that bear some written elements that are primarily material. For example, at Saka on the Nile Delta, the child touched a rock with his foot to indicate a source of fresh water for his thirsty family. His foot imprinted the stone, according to an 8th century homily, and it became a cult site. Footprints being a highly precious symbol, symbolic proof that someone was once there. Rubbed and kissed over the centuries, the Saka stone has become much larger than any infant's foot. The current of sacred energy flows from the holy presence in a certain place and is then conducted through relics and icons, images, figurines, bottles of dust and pilgrim certificates, souvenirs in the form of statuettes and models of the church, amulets, paraphernalia on, sa on sale, as you will all see in the sanctuaries of different faiths, which carry the original's blessing onwards in capsule form and suffer no diminution but keep transmitting the holy charge to the pilgrim. Given the centuries of conflict in Jerusalem between different Christian sects and between Muslims and Jews today at the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it seems hopeless wishful thinking to propose that there could be sacred spaces enjoyed in common, not fought over, that territory can be hallowed as common ground rather than as exclusive property fenced off. Can a sacred event be imprinted onto territory without sectarian consequences in ways that bring people together rather than provoke claims and counterclaims. In the apocryphal gospel, written in Arabic but not included in the Syriac version, a wonderful scene where Mary washes the linen of the infant Jesus. There's a wonderful scene. And from his exudations, very polite translation, of his sweat and tears and no doubt other bodily fluids, which is scattered with the wastewater she throws away, she's discovered that she sowed balm trees. And we find the village is actually named on the document. The fact that the village is named in the document reveals that a place of pilgrimage already existed by the 6th century and that it was a garden where the balsam trees were cultivated. Later references testify to its continued existence. I've just found it's right there on the left. In, eight, in 1285 to 95, a traveling monk, Bouchard of Mount Zion, during a tour of the East, tells us that he bathed in the stream where Mary had washed the infant Jesus and took away as much balsam wood as he could. 
It appears on the Veduta or Panorama of Cairo made by the Venetian Matteo Pagano um, in 1549. And we see this, these mosques, the water wheels, washing places for laundry, the sphinx and obelisks and various other things. And among the, and, and, so the, and there on the left is the garden of the true balsam. And not far from the garden, so that's the garden, as, and um, the map indicates the lodgings where Our Lady stayed when she fled to Egypt for fear of Herod. And below this scene, there's the garden, balsam garden, and below this scene, the pharaoh's fig. I was in Cairo eight years ago to give the Edward Said Memorial Lecture there, and Adaf Swift, the writer and founder of Palfest, and friend and huge ally of Edward's, was my host, and most generously took me to Mataria, where it's the, balm, the balm trees have long gone, but the tree which lent its shade to the Holy Family still stands. The sanctuary was restored in 2000 as part of a large project under the auspices of the National Egyptian Heritage Revival Association with the support of the then president's wife, Suzanne Mubarak, who was born a Christian, her mother was Welsh, but became officially Muslim in her role as first lady. Since then, as you all know, the Arab Spring stirred new hopes of democracy in Egypt, but the regime of General el-Sisi has instituted worse repression than Mubarak. Adaf Suez's nephew, Allah Abda al-Fatah, a leading activist, is still imprisoned in appalling conditions on hunger strike and in a very dangerous state. His visionary, poetical, his visionary political essays have been collected and you have not yet been defeated. On the day we visited Mataria, the sacred precinct was arid and empty, but it nevertheless provides a quiet refuge from the stony, I'll just, sorry, I'm going, um, a stone from a very noisy city and radiates the memory of very, very remote events as if they were still active in the present. In this sense, the Garden of Mataria is a heterotopia, as Michel Foucault proposed. It's a whole series of, like, like a theater, it's a whole series of, of time, um, temporalities are compressed into the one place. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip a bit because I'm running a little over time. Um, yeah, this is, these are my photographs of the place. Um, and you could see that the pharaoh's fig has had bad, not, not doing very well, but <laughs> it's still there. And, and, but I was interested that there are contemporary photographs showing that Muslim and Christian pilgrims still go, still go there. In a collection of essays called Sharing Secret, Sacred Spaces in the Mediterranean, there's a chapter about moulids or festivals as frequented by Christians and Muslims alike. The author, Catherine mayer Juan, who teaches Islamic history at the Sorbonne, is reflecting on religious tensions in the country. She writes that in 2009, when her article was published, they had reached a level of serious and violent conflict. And she regrets the waning of harmony between the faiths, when festivals drew together neighbors, whatever their creed, to eat, sing, dance, pray, and make offerings to the saints. Some saints were shared, not only the Virgin Mary, Mariam. Mayer Joan relates these friendly relationships to the common work of agriculture and the seasonal cycle on which the inhabitants would all depend. She states that societies which need the harvest to succeed, which, which therefore pay, and therefore pay equal attention to rainfall, dew, the rising waters of the Nile, develop easier relations with one another on account of their mutual necessity, whatever their religious allegiance. The agricultural calendar regulates their lives and binds them to a shared destiny, whatever God or prophets or holy figures they address in their praises and prayers. Agrarian communities are more likely to make common cause than urban, a very important insight garnered mainly from anthropological research. She continues pointing out that the fundamentalist side of contemporary Islam is much more severe than before and that the Copts, through a political effect of mimicry, have also begun to purify the cults and erect barriers between their beliefs. As you know, this trend among the Saudi Arabs has led to the destruction of popular shrines around Mecca on the grounds that they are rooted in pure legend and are therefore apocryphal, superstitious, and false. The site of the tomb of Amina, the prophet's mother, which pilgrims to Mecca have visited and prayed at for centuries, was destroyed in 1998. The funeral songs of local inhabitants sung over millennia by women whose traditional profession is mourning, are beginning to disappear as the Islamic authorities disapprove of these survivals of pre-Islamic ritual 
some of them even echoing the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. So to conclude, what is to be made from my attempts tonight? First, that the traveling tale Edward Said explored in relation to feeling a stranger radiates out from the voice of the storyteller or the printed page and materializes in territory and things which it infuses with significance. That this significance arises from the features of the story, that in some cases the story may be mobilized to entrench nationalistic and religious bigotry and partisan history that cause enmity and violence, but the same process of imprinting history on landscape and onto objects can work towards opposing values ecumen ecumenically, according to a principle that can be applied in secular contexts too. That in a time of mass dislocation and increasing politics of xenophobia and exclusion, a story can oppose the claims of leaders who propose harsh measures of exclusion. That the precariousness so many people are enduring can become a resource to make common cause across differences, and that fantastic beliefs and folklore may hold a germ of profound emotional value, which hardening theological dogmas and religious authoritarianism set to stamp out. And that syncretism, fabrication and fantasy, the stuff of apocrypha, often glibly denounced as inauthentic, are not always the enemies of enlightenment, but can be its catalysts. When thousands of families today are unhomed and seek shelter, where political leaders and social opinion are hostile, this narrative tradition imagines the natural world and society combining to support fugitives by portraying them as wonderful, even divine, to be welcomed and not rejected. Literature in all its forms, and not excluding the often deep and despised category of wonder tale, is fundamental to shaping how we treat one another and how we see ourselves and those who arrive on our another shore as strangers. Ways of telling shape ways of dwelling alongside one another. It's a commonplace that we live in the stories, we pass on, and the stories we invent. Thank you. Staying here because there's time for questions, I think. Perhaps there isn't time for questions. I was, I was told that there might be questions. Do ask questions. Do put your hands up. Thank you so much, Marina, for the lecture. I was, I was just uh, wanted to invite you to maybe reflect a little bit on um, your own biography and the way it links both to Edward Said's out of placeness in Egypt, uh, and particularly since you've written a, a memoir which, which, which looks at the inventory of a life mislaid. And I hadn't really thought about the resonances between the idea of a life mislaid and a life out of place. And I just wondered where you know, the resonances were, particularly since they sort of happen in, in the kind of Egypt that you um, well, so, we, yes. so well, strong. I, I, I couldn't quite hear everything you said, actually, because the microphone, but um, I, I, Said, I met Edward um, when he was giving the wreath lectures, and I was also giving the wreath lectures, and the BBC um, held a party, and we discovered that we'd been to the same nuns in our primary school. <laughs> <laughs> we both remembered them because they were very cruel. So, <laughs> and, um, and, um, and then, of course, we talked a lot about it, and and I, I used, I'm afraid, crow over him because he'd gone to America when the Cairo fire happened in 1952, but I was there and I saw it. So I used to say I was there. Um, and um, in his father's, uh, the standard stationery shop that his father ran, which sold the first Arabic typewriters, was just about two blocks from my father's bookshop. Um, so, and it's still, the, it's still there. And, and, and my father's bookshop is now a place that sells, um, it's, re, it's a retail um, I mean, sort of wholesale a clothing store, Cl clothing depot, really. But um, so I was there from after the war to 1952, when the shop was burnt down, and my father's bosses said he should leave. And, um, and the, the resonance is, I mean, it is very strange. Someone said, said to me the other day, how strange that two comparative literature scholars should be two blocks apart from their father's shops. <laughs> it's just absolutely extraordinary. Um, but I mean, the, and, and Edward, of course, I don't think was in the, was very interested in his, in his uh, sort of religious side of his upbringing. And I did feel that he wouldn't have perhaps liked very much my choice of topic. But um, 
But I think that there are sort of elements, you know, in his humanism that are, is, are open to this kind of literature, even though it's not written as proper fiction or proper poetry. Um, in terms of personal resonances, well, I mean, I... I mean, I feel very sad that some, the world of the Middle East has changed so much, not because I want to, to go back to, you know, King Farouk or anything like that, but because there was a, cos a cosmopolitanism which Edward Said absolutely epitomizes. And, and it was, a, you know, Egypt was a country of many languages and, and, and many, many different peoples. And Do you want to... You should say something, Hussein. You can comment on that. Any other questions? Yes, yes. I think it, there's a microphone. Just, I, I can add to your to the elaborations on the uh, the flight into Egypt. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, one that was current in Sicily and in Naples uh, in the 18th century, there was a uh, fortune teller. The uh, the the family um, uh, in distress. In, uh, in the desert ran into a fortune teller who fed them and, uh, and clothed them and told, and in, in return, told the fortune of uh, the child, who, which is, of course, the story of the passion. Mm -hmm. And that figure, who is, uh, was um, uh, conceived as La Zingarella, a, yes. a, a, um, shows up in, in uh, 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 in, um, Chris, in Christmas crushes in uh, Naples, oh, said, wonderful. an extra yes. biblical figure yes. Yes. that yes. shows up in the uh, yes. crushes. Yes. I'll, I'll send you. Yes. I'll send you but scans. She, yes, I'd like very much like to see that. I mean, it, does, it, it reminds me of the, the, story, the folklore of La Befana. That she also turns up in. She, she was. A, she's. She's. She's now turned into. She, her word. Her name is a contraction of Epiphany. Oh. And, the, and, the, and this particular folklore is that she's asked by the, by the three kings, you know, the right way to the baby. And um, she doesn't tell them because she doesn't believe in any of this stuff about this divine child. And she's sort of punished for that. And, and she's a sort of witch-like figure. Uh -huh. And she's the figure who comes, who brings you coal if you're a bad child. Or, or you get, or get, if you get gifts uh -huh. if you're a good child. But La Befana, and she's actually, oh, she, she's actually metamorphosed into um, the, the figure of Mother Goose. So there are lots of fairy tale collections which are called, you know, stories from La Befana. And she's rather a popular figure, but she's also an outsider. She's also got this kind of slightly Zingarella kind of, yes. Um, and she does also appear in Crescias, being realizing that she's a witness, that re she realizes the error of her disbelief. Mm. It's, but you're, you're right to put your finger on the idea of the outsider coming into the story as, the, as a witness. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I think that's that's. I think that's it. Thank you very very much. Thank you. Thank you.